All right, so I've seen the, I'm gonna call it a hive, I could be wrong, the big ball of bees that's hanging off of a tree branch. Um, is that their home? What you're seeing is actually a bee swarm is the word for that. And okay. you're right, it's a big ball of bees, probably 10,000 bees. But what happens is when this colony gets too crowded, half of the bees leave to find a new home. Okay. And that's what you're seeing on the tree is they've, they've stopped there just resting for a minute, they're passing through until they find their new home to live in. Okay. Interestingly enough, they made that decision three weeks before you saw it, and uh, they put their queen on a diet, she goes with them, <laughs> so she can fly again, and they've made a new queen. The new queen is ready to hatch the next day after you've seen the swarm, and the colony continues that way. And when the bees live, leave for the swarm, they, they tank up with honey so they have fuel to take with them so they can go to wherever they're going. And uh, you can see that ball of bees, it's just a place they're passing through. That's not permanent. They're just stopping there to check out the direction they're going and then they continue. So it's nature's way of reproducing the bees. Okay. And they reproduce that entire society and off half of them go to find a new place to be. And all that happens in a six week lifespan on average. On the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that bees are wise enough collectively to know when their current living situation has become untenable. That they say, hey, we've, we've outgrown this home, it's time to move. And I find it fascinating that there are a couple scout bees that find a new location, they come back and report to the kind of the home base, and then a couple thousand bees will leave to a place that they've never been to before. Like they haven't even like fully had that place like inspected by a certified inspector, and, but on faith, they're, they're all going to leave to find this new home. I don't know if you've ever been between homes yourself. When I first started working here at Central in May of 2017, my kids were still finishing up school in suburban Detroit. So I was commuting back and forth. And while I was here, the church was gracious enough to kind of temporarily put me up in a, in a two-bedroom, three-bedroom ranch that they owned. And so I was living there temporarily. But every week after work, I was, I was looking around for new homes. I didn't, I didn't know what that home was going to be, but I knew that that living situation was temporary, that it wasn't going to be forever. And eventually, Kelly and I were able to find a place, and we moved into that place, and stuff's been going great for the last kind of 15 months. But if you've ever bought a home or built a home, you know that you kind of live in that space between your current reality and your ultimate living space. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you know what it is to live in that tension between your current location and your ultimate destination. You know what it's like to live in that space between your current location, this world, and our ultimate destination, which is eternity in the very company of Christ. And the question that we're asking today is, how do we live with that mindset? How do we live with a, a heavenly mind, a mind that is anchored in the reality of eternity? Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says this, it says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. So what, what is the heavenly mind? The heavenly mind, uh, a mind that's got one eye on eternity, thinks like this. It, it understands paradox. It believes in participation. It pursues power and exercises proclamation. Let's start with the first idea there. The heavenly mind understands paradox. This tension is well captured by an early follower of Jesus, a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul, in a letter that he wrote to friends in the ancient city of Philippi. He says this in Philippians chapter 1. He says, for me to live on this earth is Christ, but to die and spend time in the presence of God, that's gain. If I am to go on living in this body, Good things will happen. That's fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. He goes, I'm torn between the two. I experience this tension. I desire to leave this earth and be with Christ, which is better by far, but is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. So Paul is ready to leave this life, but he's also willing to stay in it. He's navigating this tension between the now and the later, between here and there, between earth and heaven. Have you ever heard the phrase, that person is so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good? You heard that one? 
Ultimately, I think that's based on a false dichotomy. I'll argue that people who do the best earthly good do so because they are, in fact, heavenly minded. They believe that there's a purpose for life on this earth that's greater than what they can see. And as a result, they get more out of their days and out of their resources and out of their intentionality than people who believe that this world is all that there is. They view people, dignity, time, money, compassion, and justice through an eternal lens. I think people tend to view eternity on a spectrum. On the one hand, people say, this world, the physical, tangible world that I can see, that, that's the only reality. And as a result, they kind of drift into what we call hedonism, which is just the reckless pursuit of pleasure for pleasure's sake. There's an ancient motto that was kind of based on this way of thinking that says, eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we're all going to die. Like, this life is all there is. We've got to milk every ounce of pleasure that we can, because when we stop breathing, that's it. Game over. When I was a sophomore in high school, I don't know how the class discussion turned this way, but my health teacher said, if I knew that I only had hours to live, if the world was going to end, he's like, I'd get some alone time with my wife and drink as many milkshakes as I could. Like, that, that's, that's the mentality, that, like, there's no world beyond what I can see, so we just, we just got to have as much fun as we can. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're a student of Scripture, you go, well, that doesn't sound right. Unfortunately, on the other end of the extreme, there are some people who say, this world is not my home. There's an eternity out there that's better than what I'm stuck in. I can't wait to get out of this place. This, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. And this way is the opposite of hedonism. I call it escapism. And both of these positions are selfish and reckless. The first is anchored on a fear of missing out on pleasure. The second is rooted in the fear of experiencing pain. The mind of Christ reminds us that we are wired to find ultimate joy in relationship with Jesus. And that if and when we taste suffering, we know that God somehow redeems it for his glory and our good. The paradox of the heavenly mind, the mind that takes the long view on life, is this. I want to live with my eyes fixed on the future, but my feet firmly planted in the present. I want to be fully committed to this life and fully ready for the next life. I want to be fully engaged in the present moment and fully aware that this world is not our home. So that when I experience setbacks, like if you're a state fan, you know that you live to fight another day. Sorry, was, was that too soon? I, I, I apologize. The heavenly mind understands what it is to live in tension. The paradox between living here and knowing that this reality is not our ultimate destination. The heavenly mind also understands participation. It says that because God has given me this view of reality, there's something that God is asking me to do to live that reality out. The mind of Christ pushes us past our earthly appetites. Colossians 3 says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And then he says, Put to death. Because that's true, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. So Paul's saying, that was a reality that you used to be in. He goes, we don't live there anymore. So stop acting like that. He says, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. You could paraphrase that to say, Paul is saying, I want you to kill the things that are killing you. Spiritually, anyway. We don't dance with temptation. We don't play chicken with the freight train that is our flesh. We take our earthly nature out behind the barn and we put it down. We actively participate with the mind of Christ by sidestepping both lust and greed. Why? Because idolatry, the worship of our bodily desires, or worship of greed undercuts our relationship with God. So the heavenly mind says, I don't want to get mired in the quicksand of the things that are stealing me of my joy and inhibiting my ability to run in the direction that God is leading me. I, I don't have to do battle with those things daily. I can, put the, I can put them down. I can take those desires and work to eliminate them from my life. So the heavenly mind understands paradox. It understands participation in putting to death the things that kill me. The heavenly mind pursues power. Verse 8 says, but now 
You got to live differently. You left that station. You're in a new spot. Rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, in this mind of Christ mentality, there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Apostle Paul says we got, we got to put behind lust and greed because they lead us to worship something as God that isn't God. And he goes, and we got to put together all this other nonsense in our relationships because it undercuts our ability to love each other well. And Paul's got a very specific list of behaviors he wants us to rid himself, ourselves of. He goes, get rid of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, deceit. And the reason that Paul says, hey, there's no slave or free, there's no Jew, there's no Gentile, there's no circumcised, there's no un uncircumcised is because of this. He goes, in our broken way of thinking, we allow, other, we allow ourselves to think that other people are less than us. And if we think that other people are beneath us, we don't have to treat them as equals. And if they're not equals, we can allow our slander and our malice and our deceit to run wild and free and unchecked. And Paul goes, that's not, that's not how we're going to do this. That's not how we're going to function as the people of God who are collectively exercising the mind of Christ. Verse 10 says, I want you to put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of the creator. Who is doing the renewing of our minds? God is. Like, in my own, I lack the ability to make my mind think like God. But God wants to transform my mind. We hear this again in Romans chapter 12. Paul says, I want you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, we are created in the image of God, and God is renewing our knowledge. God is giving us the power to think differently. God is rebooting our minds. Have you ever had like a... Uh, like a, a desktop computer or a laptop lock up on you, like it freezes, and there are certain steps that you have to walk through to like hold the one button until it beeps long enough and the screen goes black and the whole thing reboots. And if it reboots, you go, yeah, uh, hopefully it was able to kind of like flush that bug or virus or whatever was weird out of the system and we can, we can fire on all cylinders now. I believe that that image is true for our brains. God says, hey, if you get stuck, I want you to ask me to renew your mind in the image of the creator kind of go back to the God-given factory settings where we think clearly, where we understand what is right. So sometimes in the course of our day, we'll get stuck and we just need to say, all right, God, I'm taking a time out. Will you renew my mind so I can think about this situation the way that you see it, not in a way that is um, inducing anxiety? If lust and greed threaten our relationships with God, then what threatens our relationship with other people are the character qualities that we just talked about. This is why Paul says this in verse 12, therefore, because all of these other things are toxic to us, I want you to choose a different path. You are holy and dearly loved. You are chosen by God. As a result, clothe yourselves, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. So listen to, what, listen to what he says again. He goes, I want you to, instead of indulging in all of these things that pull you away from God and pull you away from a healthy community with other people, he goes, I want you to clothe yourselves with compassion and empathy. I want you to wear kindness. I want you to choose humility and gentleness and patience and forgiveness. How many of you notice that we don't just like stumble across humility? It's a choice that we make. Like, I don't know about you, I don't, when I'm stuck in traffic or when my kids are driving me crazy, my default mode is not patience and gentleness. It is like, lower the hammer and express displeasure. That's my default mode. 
So God is saying, Steve, you have to, you, you don't just like trip across these things. You put them on. And some of us say, well, hey, this is just, I'm just, that's just who I am. This is my personality. God says, nope, you don't get to do that. This is what I'm asking you to wear today. I want you to put this on. And I want you to walk through your day in a spirit of kindness. Will you do, will you do that for me? Because that's the mind of Christ. And then he says this, he goes, so I want you to actively choose these. And then he goes, I want you to passively allow these. He goes, I want you to let peace rule in you. I want you to let gratitude rise in you. I want you to let truth rest in you. So I, I have the unique challenge, opportunity in this season of my life to be a parent. Kelly and I have four children. We've got a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 9-year-old, a 7-year-old. And every day they're asking us for something. Can I do this? Can I order this online? Can I play this game? Can I play with a friend? Can I watch this movie? Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I? And it's my job as a parent to filter those requests and say, no, you can't do this because it's illegal. Or, yes, you can do this because that sounds like a fun way for me to have 15 minutes of free time, all right? So we're constantly, like, we get to, it's our job as, like, parents who have our best our children's best interest in mind, to create a filter that says yes or no, I will allow this, I won't allow this. In the same way, the Apostle Paul says the person who is the gatekeeper for what happens in your brain is you. You get to decide what you will let into your brain, what you will take, let take root in your soul, what you will let yourselves think about. That's why in a different passage, Paul says, I want you to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus. You don't get to let our imagination run rampant. We get to step in and referee that situation and say, you know what? Here's what I love. He goes, the peace of Christ wants to rule in you. The only question is, will you let it? The gratitude of Jesus Christ wants to take root in your soul. Are you going to allow it to take up residence there? Or are you going to squeeze it out with constant complaint or criticism, cynicism or comparison? See, the truth of Jesus Christ wants to rest in you. But if you choose to believe lies about God and about others and about yourself, that truth will not be able to sit anchored there. So I want, you to, I want you to take this image in your mind. I just want you to imagine peace, gratitude, and truth as people who are knocking on the door of your mind saying, will you, will you let us in? And all you have to do is say, yes. Yes, I, I, I would like that. I would like to choose peace over anxiety, gratitude over ingratitude, truth over lies today. Spirit of God, will you wash everything in my mind so that it thinks about the things that you think about. Now, there's one verse in here that I want to call your attention to. It says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Think about this for a moment. How does the Lord forgive you? Like when you do wrong and you come back to God and come clean, what does his forgiveness look like? I think his forgiveness is immediate, it's total, and it's unconditional. It's immediate, it's total, and it's unconditional. So when God asks me to forgive other people in the manner in which I have been forgiven, what does God want it to look like? He wants it to be immediate, total, and unconditional. I can't do that. I do not have it in me to let people who have wronged me off the hook the way that Jesus does. Because here's the truth. All of us have been slighted. Most of us have been wronged. And many of us have been traumatized. So I, I don't mean to make light or undersell or underestimate the toll that forgiveness is going to take on a great many of us. A little over a month ago, I was on a retreat with some friends, and the theme of the whole retreat was forgiveness, which was not comfortable for me at all. Like, I'll, I'll sit through a 50-minute talk on forgiveness. I don't want to think about it for two days. 
And when I think about the way that Jesus forgives us, I'm reminded that when Jesus hung on a Roman cross, bleeding out, like gasping for his last breaths, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them. And then here's the line that always catches me, because they don't even know what they do. They don't even know what they're doing. So if that's true, it's, it's not like a, a squad of Roman soldiers rolled out of bed one day and they said, this Jesus guy, we're going to stick it to him. Chances are they had no idea who he was. They were just showing up to another day at the office. Why? Because they tortured and killed people all the time. It wasn't personal. They were just reading from the only cultural script that they had been given, which was what? Force and violence. The only thing they knew was force and violence. And some of the people in our lives who have deeply wounded us, the only thing that they know are lies and manipulation. The only thing that they know are deceit and betrayal. The only thing that they know is scrapping for survival no matter whose toes they step on. Now, make no mistake, this does not excuse the wrong that is done to us. But maybe it allows us to explain where a person was coming from when they did whatever it was that they did and allowed us not to forgive the act, but to forgive the person. So when we were on this retreat, I had a memory that I hadn't, hadn't had in years. When I was in elementary school, there was a neighbor kid across the street who used to rough me up on occasion in the block and a half that it took me to walk home. And I, I don't know that I was ever, like, physically battered, but it was mentally unnerving for me. It was not something that I appreciated. A few years later, I was in middle school. I was walking home from eighth grade, and I saw red and blue flashing lights across the street at the home that he lived. Only to find out within the next hour that he had taken his own life. And when I look at that situation in the rearview mirror of my life, I said, is it possible that that young man was navigating heartache and nightmares that I knew nothing about? That I knew nothing about. And the angst that he was navigating didn't necessarily have anything to do with me as a fourth grader. I just happened to be in the blast zone of his pain. So the mind of Christ says, if you want to walk in freedom, you got to forgive as you have been forgiven. So when we put on humility, when we put on compassion, we put on patience and gentleness, we are able to forgive because Jesus Christ is allowing us to see things about that situation that we could not see on our own. The mind of Christ understands what it is to walk in paradox. It understands what it means to participate in putting toxic things to death. It understands where the source of our power comes from. It's not our striving comes from the very spirit of God. And finally, the heavenly mind pursues proclamation. Colossians 3.17 says this, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, do in light of what Christ has done and what he is yet to do. Here's what I love about this understanding. When we live with the mind of Christ, we know that even though there are many things in our life that, that we cannot control, we know how the story ends. We know how the story ends. We know that the story ends with God on the throne, with his people fully redeemed. It ends with a song of joy in the presence of God. That, that's a good ending. So some of you know that I've been like assistant coaching my son's football team and the end of the season four and two are so much happier about that than uh, the way that it went last season. But here's what our head coach kept trying to teach our guys. He goes, guys, when the game starts, he goes, come out swinging. Like these are third and fourth graders. It's hard to get any amount of focus out of them at all, especially at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. He goes, if you come out swinging, if you score first, if you make a stop first, he goes, you can be ahead. And he goes, let me tell you this. It's a whole lot more fun to play from ahead 
than it is to play from behind. And tell you what, when our team got up by one touchdown, two touchdowns, three touchdowns at halftime, the game became exponentially more joy-filled. They could play, you know what, we could try all the plays that were deep in our playbook that we weren't even sure we could execute. Why? We could take risks. Because the game was already in hand. We knew, we knew how it was going to end. We, we could play loose. We could play free. We could play with joy. Guys who didn't usually get to play could jump in. It changed the entire tenor of the game. Let me tell you this. When we fail to receive and appreciate the mind of Christ, we can start buying into the lie that somehow we as followers of Jesus are playing from behind. And when we always think that we're playing from behind and the world is against us and the deck is stacked against us and that I, I may or may not win this particular battle, then we start, we, we start playing scared. And we live our lives very conservatively and we live our lives on lockdown. And we might not do a lot of bad things, but we might fail to do many of the good things that God has designed and wired us to do. Which is why I love in the liturgy, one of the lines that Nate included was not just forgive us for what we have done, but forgive us what we, for what we ought to have done and didn't do. I believe that when we, when we know how the story ends, we are able to take risks that are God-honoring with our lives, with our resources, with our careers, with our families, with our energy. And some of you say, well, that sounds a little bit reckless because life is still uncertain. Granted, I'm not saying that there are pieces of this life that won't be challenging. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have trouble. It's the greatest understatement of the New Testament. But then he said what? He goes, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And the truth is, we're, we're going to lose some battles between here and eternity. But we know who's won the war. We're going we're to lose some battles. There are going to be some setbacks. There are going to be some losses. There are going to be moments of heartache and grief. But we can view those through the lens of the bigger picture, which is God redeems all things and stands in unchallenged victory over sin, death, and hell in all of its forms. Full stop. Game over. Story ended. And when we live our lives with that perspective, like we're playing from ahead and that the game is already in hand and the victory is already decided, we, we, can, we can face challenges head on and say, you know what? Today I'm going to do this day in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today I'm going to have this conversation in the name of Jesus. I'm going to make these entertainment choices in the name of Jesus. I'm going to pursue this recreation. I'm going to make this business decision. Or I'm going to handle my ethics or my business or my neighborhood conflicts in the name of Jesus. Why? Because I want everybody who's watching me to know what I value and where I'm headed. And I think the world is done with our words. The world is done with our words. They want to see people who are living in line with what they claim to believe. And if we handle our conflicts in the name of Jesus, and we handle our business in the name of Jesus, and we make decisions in our parenting in the name of Jesus, then we end up living the kind of life that is compelling enough to draw people who are on the fringes into the center for them to be able to say, it seems like you're living your life with a sense of raw enthusiasm and great purpose and focus and intentionality that I don't have. Will you, will you tell me why? And I, I don't know about you, I want to live the kind of life that provokes other people to ask questions about what I believe and where I'm headed. And our great desire is that we would be the kind of church that has the mind of Christ. That we don't get bogged down in nonsense. We don't get stuck in the weeds. We don't end up quibbling about stuff that, quite frankly, doesn't matter. In the aftermath of September 11th, I read an interview with a celebrity in Rolling Stone. And she said, on September 10th, there were a lot of things that our family was concerned about. And at the end of the day, on September 11th, our family wasn't concerned about any of those things anymore. Because in the light of life and death, in the light of high stakes, we realize that there's a lot of things that don't matter and a few things that do. And she and her family came up with this little promise, this covenant that they made with each other. They said this, they said, we finally decided that if it doesn't matter in five years, it doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter in five years, it doesn't matter. So I want you to think about the things that are most anxiety inducing for you right now things that are out of your control. And I want you to like fast forward to 2023. 
or 2030, 2050, or the day that Jesus comes back, or the day that you exit this planet. Does it matter then? Because if it doesn't matter then, don't, don't let it tie your shoelaces together now. Jesus says, I want you to live a life that is fully aligned with how I think and what I care about. And so if you're stuck, I would, I would love for you to take somebody that you trust. Maybe it's a spouse or a best friend or a small group leader and say, look, I want to I take this challenge from Colossians 3 to set both my mind and my heart on things above. And just invite other people in your life who love you and trust you and say, if you find my mind settling on things that are below or my heart caring about things that are below, will you, will you just let me know? Because we get this one life. We get one life to live in the name of Jesus, one life to steward for the glory of God the Father and the people that he's called us to influence for his glory. Are we living it fully? Are we living it focused? Are we living it well? Now, in just a moment, the team's going to come back up and close us with some songs of celebration that remind us of who we are and where we're headed. But as you do, I, just, I want to just pause briefly to celebrate what God has done in and through this series. Hundreds of you have participated in small groups. Uh, in fact, almost, almost 80 people have signed up in a C6 group, and this is the first time they've ever been a part of any group at Central. Hundreds more have reconnected in community through this small group initiative. And God's answering prayers. God's allowing people to meet new friendships. They're getting encouragement. We're getting accountability. We're praying for one another. Like Kelly and I have been a part of it. We've been in town for about a year and a half. We've never felt more connected to our church family than we have in the last six weeks. Because we're meeting people who live in our neighborhood, who value what we value, who are encouraging us to keep our eyes on the prize and to live like we're caring about the right things in the right way. So for those of you who have been enriched, your lives have been enriched by this experience, you want to continue learning, you want to continue growing, know that, that there are two initiatives you can sign up for in the lobby immediately following the service. One is for Marriage Connect. Small group experience allows you to focus on deepening your marriage. And the other one's called Apprentice, a chance for you to kind of take some very tangible next steps in learning what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Also, if you're curious about when the next C6, the next six-week run of small groups is going to happen, it's going to happen February 10th to March 24th. So it's going to be the six weeks that lead up to spring break. And the theme is going to be living life, navigating that tension between fear and courage, fear and love, fear as somebody who's isolated or confidence as somebody who's a part of God's family. So let me pray for us, and then we'll spend our last few moments together celebrating who God is and what he's called us to do. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the example that you've given for us. We thank you that your thinking on everything was crystal clear. And Lord, I pray that you would give us grace as we try to live in this tension between where we are and the place you have us destined for. God, I pray that you would allow us to be ruthless as we put to death things in our mind that don't belong there. As we, with, with just passion for you, root out everything in our hearts that should have no home and invite the power of the Spirit to renew our minds, reminding us that we are created in your image. That when you take a hold of our lives, we have both the capacity and the power to think about the things that you think about, to care about the things that you care about, nothing less and nothing else. And God, I thank you that you've given us this grid to give you credit for everything that we do. And I pray, Lord, that for my life, for my family, for my work, for my remaining days, however long and short they may be, God, give me grace to live every minute in the name of Jesus for the glory of God the Father. God, thank you for songs that condition both our minds and our hearts to come into alignment with yours. That in music, we celebrate what's true. And in corporate worship, we celebrate it and affirm it together. 
So God, allow the words that we sing to be a reflection of what we do believe or what we hope to believe. By your grace and in your name, we pray these things through Christ Jesus. Amen and amen.